top of the hour. And uh, welcome to everyone. We have, uh, what do we have? We have about eight of us on at the moment, and it looks like maybe a few more will be coming in as we uh, get things rolling here. And welcome back. Welcome. So great to have all of us here. I was just talking with Catherine there before we got going. Um, and uh, she was acknowledging that it was it was a strong session for her last time, and she had just uh, watched the recording. And I really appreciated uh, a fresh perspective because um, might, it might be um, I don't know how it is for you all when you're creating something, but uh, I can I can be a little um, hard on myself or on on. The, uh, past performance and uh, to get that uh, that a strong difference has been made in some way it was uh, those are comments I really appreciated Catherine thank you uh, again if I could ask if you haven't muted yourself thank you Anna that you would please do that um, oh, look lots of folks coming in wonderful wonderful good to see you all my name is Dean Walker, and uh, you have stumbled into session two of, of deep adaptation in times of collapse. And um, this is a six session online series that is also available to be watched in the recordings uh, that will be posted after each session. We have a few uh, folks who have signed up after session one. So this will be new information to them unless they've watched. Hi, Lee. No. Hey, and if I could ask you to go ahead and mute yourself, please, and we'll um, off we'll go. What I've been trying to do, and I, I really don't mean it to be in any way uh, condescending or um, annoyingly repetitive, but um, each time I send out an email or each time we start up one of these um, sessions, I, uh, I just like to recap a little bit about what is this thing that we're doing. Um, mostly because I have found in my own process of this, even though I am deep in it and have been deep in it up to my earlobes every day for the past five years, I often need to remind myself, what is this that we're talking about? Um, what I've noticed is that I tend to normalize, um, you know, being an average, especially a privileged American, I tend to just normalize what's going on in the world. And uh, I need this kind of recap to remind myself that these are not indeed normal times by most people's definition. And that what we're encountering are um, circumstances and, and consequences that humanity has never had to face before. Hi everybody, this is a good time to break in and uh, through the miracle of modern video editing, I'm going to replace uh, the majority of what was recorded in my introduction to last Saturday's session two of this learning series, Deep Adaptation in Times of Collapse. Uh, needless to say, I was a bit on the stiff side in my delivery, and uh, I was looking for a way to convey some of the urgent uh, issues involved with deep adaptation, including what got us here. And uh, I needed to look no further than a, a particular recent document from Jim Bendel's blog. And it's called The Love in Deep Adaptation, a Philosophy for the Forum. Uh, many people who have signed up for this particular learning series have come from a uh, a posting in that deep adaptation forum that Professor Bendel has created last year or this year. Um, and um, I have included the link to this particular article so you can read it in its entirety 
um, at your leisure. But I'd like to just give you this as a starting point for this particular session, session two of this series. So again, the love and deep adaptation of philosophy for the forum. And, and this is um, really addressed to people who have already signed up for the forum or particularly for those people who are volunteering as I am as a moderator for the coaching and counseling group within the forum. This is a way of clarifying and, and offering some words uh, around which we can resonate in these remarkable times. Many more people are waking up to the predicament we are in, where rapid climate change threatens the future of our societies and even our species. Hundreds of thousands of people have downloaded the deep adaptation paper and thousands joined the Facebook group. Launching the deep adaptation forum is one means of enabling that interest to become useful collaboration. As people begin to work with our colleagues and discuss what deep adaptation could mean and what it doesn't, we wish to clarify some core ideas that have been expressed in more detail elsewhere. Deep adaptation refers to the personal and collective changes that might help us prepare for and live with a climate-induced collapse of our societies. Unlike mainstream work on adaptation to climate change, it doesn't assume that our current economic, social, and political systems can be resilient in the face of rapid climate change. When using the term social or societal collapse, we are referring to the uneven ending to our current means of sustenance, shelter, security, pleasure, identity, and meaning. Others may prefer the term societal breakdown when referring to the same process. We consider this process to be inevitable. Because of our view that humanity will not be able to respond globally fast enough to protect our food supplies from chaotic weather. People who consider that societal collapse or breakdown is either possible, likely, or already unfolding also are interested in deep adaptation. Four questions guide our work in deep adaptation within the forum. Resilience. What do we most value that we want to keep and how? Relinquishment. What do we need to let go of so as not to make matters worse? Restoration. What could we bring back to help us with these difficult times? Reconciliation. With what and whom shall we make peace as we awaken to our mutual mortality? These questions invite exploration of deep adaptation to our climate predicament in order to develop both collapse readiness and collapse transcendence. Collapse readiness includes the mental and material measures that will help reduce disruption to human life, enabling an equitable supply of the basics like food, water, energy, payment systems, and health. Collapse transcendence refers to the psychological, spiritual, and cultural shifts that may enable more people to experience greater equanimity toward future disruptions and the likelihood that our situation is beyond our control. Uncertainty and lack of control are key aspects of our predicament. We do not know whether what we do will slow climate change and societal collapse or reduce harm at scale. It looks likely to us that many will die young and that we may die sooner than we had expected. That does not mean we do not try to extend the glide and soften the crash and learn from the whole experience. 
One thing that rapid climate change can help us learn is the destructiveness of our delusions about reality and what is important in life. Key to this delusion is the emphasis many of us place on our separate identities. Since birth, we have been invited to other people and nature. We often assume that other people to be less valuable, smart, or ethical as us. Or we assume we know what they think. We justify that in many ways using stories of nationality, gender, morals, personal survival, or simply being too busy. Similarly, we have been encouraged to see nature as separate from us. Therefore, we have not regarded the rivers, soils, forests, and fields as part of ourselves. Taken together, this othering of people and nature means we dampen any feelings of connection or empathy to such a degree that we can justify exploitation, discrimination, hostility, violence, and rampant consumption. That's the end of what I'm gonna read for now from Professor Bendel and Katie Carr, who drafted that. I might add as the uh, last piece to that, that this, uh, list that included how we can justify exploitation, discrimination, hostility, violence, and rapid, rampant consumption. I might include extinction. Uh, one part of my body of work and the particular interpretations that I have, uh, similar to what we've just heard from Professor Bendel, is that extinction, there is no more violent traumatic act than causing extinction. Human beings are causing extinctions at the rate of 150 to 200 species a day and have been doing so for a number of years now. And that number is actually increasing. We are living in an era that is now called a mass extinction event. So a uh, little bit difficult to um, look the other way in terms of how we are justifying the violence and trauma that we are delivering to ourselves and to our beyond human fellow earthlings. So let's move on to the actions of this particular session, session two of deep adaptation in times of collapse. A few moments ago, I mentioned about uh, my particular body of work and some of the constructs that I use to describe or uh, distinguish various elements of uh, this predicament that we're in. And really at the source of it, at the uh, causal level of this predicament, uh, I'm asserting that we have um, gotten here, we have arrived here because of our disconnection. Uh, both individually and collectively, we have disconnected from all the primary sources of meaning in human life. And those would be deeper self, other people, earth, and soul. I'd like to offer a fifth R to uh, Professor Bendel's list of four R's that we just read a few moments ago. And that was, is really at the center of this body of work that we're all involved with in this series. And that is reconnection. Reconnection with deeper self, with other people, with earth and soul. Um, it's my assertion that uh, really there is no right action for us all to engage with um, until we begin this process of reconnecting ourselves. Um, the assertion goes further to say that if we are to engage in life without that, without reconnecting, that it will be more of the same. It promises to be more of the same, which is 
a very thinly veiled, uh, deeply destructive, actually ecocidal and suicidal business as usual human operating system. So the stakes are really high. That's, uh, <laughs> that's one way to put it. So we find ourselves in this learning series together. I am deeply humbled to be a part of this. Uh, it is the largest scale collective conversation that I've uh, had the opportunity to be a part of yet. It's been a struggle to find a small handful here or there in, our, in my community. And uh, there are times when we can have a modest size online group. This is the largest I've seen yet, and I really need to um, take my hat off to uh, Professor Bendel for creating the Deep Adaptation Forum, which I believe will greatly increase the resonance of this, the most important conversation in the history of humankind. Get a sense that this will help it grow, to say the least. As we take on the challenge of coming together in a very short period of time in six different sessions, 90 minutes each sessions, and in this case, for those who are attending live, it's two sessions in May, June, and July of 2019. So, um, I'm thrilled uh, <laughs> that there are those who are joining live. Right now, that's about 20 out of 100 that are currently uh, enrolled in this program that are showing up for the live sessions. We are uh, today breaking in uh, into smaller groups and we'll be doing that the majority of the time for the remaining sessions. And uh, one thing that I attempted to do and don't really think I did a particularly good job of is asking for us to bring a very different uh, and more attuned sense of curiosity and uh, presence to our participation whenever we come together. And it, I, you are fully invited. <laughs> it is part of my practice and I, I invite you, you may well already be doing this, but to bring those qualities to every aspect of your life. Really, why not? So particularly those questions, uh, excuse me, if you have questions about, so what I mean by presence or warmth and curiosity, if I just ask for you to look at how many meetings you've been in, how many uh, times you've gotten together with other people, and you've had a less than fulfilling experience. You come away from the meeting uh, perhaps annoyed or drained or and, and possibly inspired. I don't mean to say that all meetings are bad. What I am trying to say is that it's very clear to me that, that uh, the world as it's showing up now is calling on us to bring forth a very different presence, a very different level of awareness than what we bring forth in the business as usual human operating system. Uh, if you've engaged with the first materials that I've sent out to you, um, you will have already self-assessed on the lovely simple scale that Paul Chaferka provided for us going from dead asleep to full awareness of the predicament at the global scale. Uh, it's a remarkable piece of work, and I strongly recommend that you self-assess on that scale as soon as possible if you haven't already. Right after that, it was the uh, request for you to self-assess at what scale you engage in this world from the deeply intimate, the closest possible uh, level of awareness to ourselves, our own body, our own experience. Out from there, of course, the people who are, um, are perhaps animals and, and places and things that are most important to us, our innermost circle. And then on out from there, 
<clears throat> having this acuity, having named this acuity, this uh, ability to start to map yourself. This is really an opportunity, these six sessions together, these three months together. There was so much time in between the 90-minute sessions. I'm really counting on you to engage as best you will in mapping out your own reality. And it looks to me like uh, what we can do, many people that I have the privilege of working with find it useful to look at mapping out their world as if they have a foot in, in fact, two worlds. One world is, of course, the business as usual world we've all grown up in. It's everything and uh, every way that things happen in our world that we are so used to, and it is clearly in collapse currently and more to come. The other foot in the other world is in fact in a world that has not been articulated yet. It actually hasn't even been imagined yet. And as Professor Bendel says there and elsewhere in his work, we might not have an opportunity even to imagine another world. Uh, humanity might not be up to the task. What I uh, am interpreting in Professor Bendel's words and certainly in my own work is that really what our work is in that case is to live with the greatest quality of presence that we can bring forth in the face of, really, that's the word predicament. And in that predicament, we have no promise of solution. We have no promise of a particular preferred outcome. And so the, the demand and the calling of these times is extraordinary. So that kind of loops back to my request of us bringing a different level of awareness and presence to each of these sessions, to each of the uh, times we share in the, in the small group sessions. And if you're doing this study, this learning series on your own, and you're uh, watching the recordings at home, I would strongly suggest that you find someone to do these very basic, very simple exercises. It's an order of magnitude more valuable to do this work with another person or even better with a study group. So uh, I'll be including a tremendous amount more information in both this email that you're gonna be reading in order to click on this link, uh, and also in the other between session emails, I'll be providing tremendous amount of information, video uh, links to interviews and audio link interviews of exemplars, people who have been doing this inner, this deep inner work, this significant inner work for quite a while. I hope you will find the, being able to watch and listen to these exemplars in action, in conversation, in process. It's for me deeply inspiring because otherwise, you know, when I'm listening, in a less than curious way. And I'm listening in the more default business as usual way. I notice that the level of despair or apathy or any of those, I guess I could consider them negative uh, choices in, in my own being and my own state of being. I notice that they can creep in like a tide. And when I'm able to experience these exemplars and listen to how they're holding this world and how they're presencing themselves in this world, it's, it's extraordinarily helpful. So I hope you find that the same way. We're now going to be shifting gears into doing the recorded version 
of what was done in the small groups. My apologies in advance, we don't have an, a uh, recording of any of the small groups doing these questions, and I will um, seek permission next time to do that with a particular chosen group. But in the meanwhile, uh, I hope again you will go beyond just watching this video for information or on especially on your own. I hope you will give a call to a good friend and um, enjoy over a cup of tea doing these exercises. So um, let's move on. So in this and every a uh, small group sharing exercise that we'll be doing for these three months. I'm gonna ask you to prepare yourself for just a few moments before you actually share, when it's your time to share in that small group. There are just a few steps to this preparation that I would uh, ask that you do again every time. And you are so invited to take this practice uh, into your personal life. And in just a moment, I'll also qualify that. You'll see in a moment how some instances in your private life might not invite every one of the steps, but let's do them right now. So the first is to pause and breathe. I'm going to do this in real time. I'm going to actually do all the steps and then I'm gonna go back, as you, you're seeing the list on the screen anyway, uh, we'll go through the list together. But I'm going to do this in real time so you can get a sense of the timing because the small group sharing goes quickly. You have um, perhaps four minutes for the entire share. You want this preparation to go very, very quickly and take up as little of those four minutes as you can. <sighs> Okay, I've made eye contact with my fellow screen mates. I'm noticing sensations. Uh, there's a coolness to the air that I'm sitting in. I can feel my backside in the chair. I can feel a little discomfort in my back right now. And I can feel a little tension across my diaphragm uh, near my heart area. Feelings, I. I have a, a little excitement, a little sadness. I can feel a tension that seems like it, it's close to a feeling of frustration somewhere in the background. Uh, mostly I have a feeling of, of excitement and, and a bit of joy. And then I would go right here now into whatever the questions or the assignment is, the opportunity is in that small group sharing. So um, there's a reason why I'm asking you to do this. And this is actually very well connected with the meditation exercise that I've sent out to you. The combination of Philip Shepard's elevator shaft exercise and the music that follows. Uh, it is a uh, multi-part series, and it is meant to do much of what this has just possibly done for you when you do it. That is to pause, disconnect for just a moment from that outside energy, the uh, workaday world energy that you may be separating from, becoming more present with your partners in the small group, and that can also be done by breathing, brings us a bit more into our body, starts that embodiment process by all the sensations that come with that breathing. Brief eye contact while doing these other, this pausing and breathing, taking a moment to realizing and connecting with the humanity of the people who are on this call and in this small group with you. Sensations, staying in contact with those uh, partners on the screen, 
Um, sensations are, again, another profound and simple way to bring us to more presence, to being more fully present in the moment. There is no more uh, precise way to bring ourselves to presence than through the immediacy of our sensations. So to just articulate two, three sensations, that's enough. It brings your attention into full presence in your body. And in articulating it to your partner, to the person you're speaking with, there is a way in which you are already starting to connect. That connection with them can go a step further without even knowing or realizing it or even intending it necessarily. When you scan your own emotions, your own feelings inside yourself, then articulate them out to your partner. There's a way in which your partner, your partner's field and your field start to reach out and actually blend with one another. There's a way in which there's a coherence that's starting to occur just in your sharing and their listening. So that's what we're asking each of the people, that's what we asked each of the people to do in these, the first exercises of this type in this series on session two. Please keep that in mind and uh, refer back to those steps in each of these three different assignments that we did on Saturday. The first one is your name. Where are you from? What are the relationships that are immediate in your world? Do you, or do you live with other people? Are you in a relationship? Spouse? Uh, do you have kids? So not a long description of that, just really the basics, just letting know this is, these are the relationships in my world. The second part of this the first exercise is the number of family or friends you socialize with in a month. So this is uh, more than a text or two in a given moment or incident. It's, um, it's a time when ideally how often you get together in person and spend at least a few minutes connecting in whatever that means for you. So the number of family members or friends you socialize with each month. This is not something to take a lot of time with either. It's something to just give a quick scan and it's a rough number. So for instance, my number was six. <laughs> that includes my sweetie and my dog. <laughs> what has you doing this learning series? That's the third part of this, the first exercise. What, and so what has you doing this learning series? The last question here is what matters most to you in life? You might recall that question from the very first set of writing prompts in the very first letter that I sent out to you, the welcome letter. If not, you might want to go back to the welcome letter and check it out. That is a big part of the journaling practice that we've requested that you join in with during these three months. So these questions are up on the screen. Your name, where you're from, relationships, do you have kids, number of family and friends you socialize with each month, what has you doing this learning series? What matters most to you in life? If I were you, I would remember to go through those first few steps to prepare yourself. Go right into it. Move relatively quickly first through those first two in particular. A little bit more time on the third. And really give yourself as much of your 
four minutes as you can. Take four minutes. And if you are graced with being able to have another person with you or other people with you, then give each other four minutes to go through that. Okay. So you might want to just pause the video and then uh, we will come out the other side. You will hear a little bit of sharing uh, from the folks from Saturday. And you may, take, you may want to take some time to either journal if you're alone or share with others how this was for you. Be back in a few minutes. Okay, welcome back from your time in doing exercise number one. Now let's take a look at a couple of shares from people who were present on, with us online on Saturday and hear what they had to say, something that might have surprised them that they saw. And all right, do we have everybody back? I think we do. So just a quick question for y'all. Um, you know, we won't have time for everybody to give feedback at the, at the whole group level, but I, I, but I am curious, um, do you have a, uh, a safe container, so to speak? Do you have a support group? Do you have a, a one or more relationships in your life with whom you can ask each other the question, what matters most to you? You know, when I, when I look at it, uh, that kind of question, it's, it's a little more intense and a little, uh, a little deeper than most of the folks <laughs> that I hang out with on a regular basis uh, ask each other. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I guess my question, uh, there are two questions. One is, do you have a safe relationship or relationships in your life in which you ask each other that kind of that level of question from time to time and also I'm asking a question of uh, did anyone find themselves saying something that surprised did you surprise yourself in answering any of these questions so if once you start with the second one if there's anyone who knows, yeah, I was a little surprised at, at what I said about this. Um, why don't you just unmute yourself and let us know what that is. Hello? Hey there. I, hi. I was surprised to hear myself say um, that I don't know who I am anymore. Yeah. Uh, and that was pr preceded by identifying myself as a environmental activists that always held on to hope that what I was doing was worthwhile and was going to make a difference. And the science that I've seen in the last couple months, I don't have that hope anymore. So I don't know what matters to me anymore. Yeah. And Susan, if you don't mind me asking, um, do you have uh, safe relationships that in which you can ask each other that this kind of Questions of consequence, that I might call it. I, I have a very good relationship with my husband, but he's able to just uh, live in the other world. He knows what's going on, and I guess it doesn't bother him. <laughs> no, it's two worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I, we can talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, unless there's someone else who would like to share a particular surprise. Kurt, do you have something? Yeah, well, I was surprised and I wasn't surprised because it's my work, but I, I did make the comment in my group that I was disappointed that this is almost an entirely white group. Yeah. Uh, you know, white spaces are, you know, I mean, I'm constantly pushing back on white spaces and trying to do what I can to, to you know, to, you know, bring a different consciousness to that, so. God, I'm, I'm with you, and thank you very much for saying that. I, yeah. 
a, a bit of craziness there. Unless there are other surprises to be shared, I'd like to set us up right away for another round. And this one is, there was somebody who left a comment earlier unrelated to this particular process, but they, they mentioned that it's not a very trauma aware piece. This, this uh, you know, I asked for feedback about a, a meditation piece and their comment was, it doesn't seem to be very trauma informed how it's designed and delivered and so on. And I actually agree. And it was a, it was a great wake up call for me to hear that. And I, I want to want you to know I'm I'm really stepping into um, a pretty bold zone with you in these questions, and I would like to continue to bring this kind this level of bold questions in introspective questions, uh, prompt, prompting our sharing. Um, for all the sessions. I also want you to know, not, not that you need any permission here, but please take care of yourselves. We are in an environment where, um, well, I think it would be um, likely that we could assume confidentiality here and safety here. It's, it's really important to mention. Um, we are on an, in an online environment that has almost no way of clearing people uh, in a way that would allow us to feel far more relaxed and, and open with each other if we were able to be in, in person with one another, if we had some sort of screening process and so on. We don't have that. And so uh, what I am asking for now is uh, that we each um, commit to a uh, strong level of confidentiality, of not mentioning anyone's name or any content of their sharing at any point in any, in any of the sessions of this series, um, and also just a loving kindness to be informing our participation with each other. These questions are plenty disturbing on their own without us bringing perhaps uh, any sort of judgment or uh, argumentation and so on. So if you are willing to maintain a confidentiality in these calls, and if you are willing to bring a consistent level of loving kindness to the best of your ability. Would you put your hand up toward your camera like I am so that I, we can see each other, bringing that to each other? Yeah, thank you so much for that. Thank you. All right, so um, the second round of questions for today I live in a, a very large apartment complex with, a, I think there are 600 units here. So a lot of people, a lot of small families and a, a few small families in the building that we live in. Uh, we get a chance to talk with folks all the time, the young parents, young families, wonderful. It's, it's really great to be able to connect with people in that way. Um, I bring almost never bring up my line of work with these folks, um, very seldom. You know, it's something I kind of ease into, um, but I'm noticing that the level of um, what I call sober data, I think Susan was kind of pointing to that, there's, there's a level of um, data and um, vetted scientific projections about various aspects of collapse of our systems that are pretty much in the daily news these days, not in mainstream news perhaps, but definitely in on um, many, many vetted sources. So it's a little bit difficult to imagine how could one be a parent? I am not a parent. I have worked with 
uh, children and families for my whole life, but I have not been a parent, and I'm not pretending to hold anyone in judgment here, but I'm noticing that there are, I can count on one hand, the number of parents of uh, new families, young children, who have um, opened up a conversation of, regarding what's, what's happening in our world with regard to collapse. Um, could I just see a show of hands of people who did see the uh, Paul Kingsnorth and his family video piece? Did you, did some folks see that? Some yes, some no, okay. So um, I would recommend highly, if you haven't seen it, see it. I, that's one of that small handful of people that of uh, parents that I have seen that have, are doing an extraordinary job of speaking the truth to their family. So um, I'm going to ask us to dive into that um, remarkably uh, charge-filled conversation on our own. And uh, how that's going to go is we'll, I'm going to ask that you divide up into three. And again, if you're, if, if you're the one pair that's out there, uh, two of you, um, do your best. But uh, in the role of three, um, there would be the one person who's the speaker, one person who's a reflective listener, and the third person who's the timer and also just monitoring for too much conversation or too much uh, asking of questions. This is really not meant to be a conversation. It's meant to be a person speaking and a reflective listener. About every 30 seconds or so, the speaker will give that reflective listener a few moments to just give back the essence of what they've heard them say, what they've heard the speakers say. This is not meant to be then a number of clarifying questions, and yes, I agree with that, or it's meant to just be the reflection of the essence of what the speaker's been saying. So first off, any questions about those three roles? Okay. The questions for this one, what does collapse mean? When might it happen? How might life change for us in collapse? What could people do to stop collapse from happening? And um, what I'd like you to do is imagine yourself, if you are the speaker, that you are speaking to a very bright 10-year-old person. A very bright 10-year-old person. Any questions about that? Okay, thank you, and uh, off we go. So please remember this time to also do the same preparations, the pausing, the breathing, make eye contact with the folks that you're speaking with or into a mirror if you're alone. Then feelings, excuse me, sensations and feelings and then begin. Take four minutes for each of you who will be speaking and rotate roles. What I'd like to invite here is not to uh, pretend or play a role. For instance, if you're in the listening role, don't worry about pretending to be 10 years old or playing the role of a 10 year old. Um, I would request of you to be ready to just reflect roughly every minute or so 
going to be asking the speaker to pause. Should be pausing from time to time anyway, but pause. And in that pause, the listener has the opportunity to just recall what, what emerges in their memory, what stands out as a central piece of what this person was just speaking about. <clears throat> this is not a parroting, so I'm not expecting for anyone to have memorized what the other person said. This is a, um, this is a brief sharing of what sticks out in, in a person's memory as they recount back to the person that, I'm, gee, I'm recalling this. I'm noticing that you had a lot of emphasis on the particular point about when it might happen, for example. So uh, the reflection is just a few moments and a few words. It is not a conversation. It's a, it's a feeding back of a couple of things that stood out in what you've just been listening to. Then speaker, please begin again and keep going. So this is exercise two in session two of deep adaptation in times of collapse. Please begin. All right, welcome back. I'd like to play for you a few of the responses that people shared on Saturday as they went through this same exercise. I'll be right back. We can uh, go through a bit more to wrap up this session from our side on the recording side. Welcome back, everyone. So I know that there, I've spoken with a couple of people and there are a number of different reactions to this last sharing. I don't think we have quite the space to have everyone share, but is there someone who would like to share how, the, how this impacted you? I found that um, verbalizing this was quite difficult for me. It was as if I'd, I'd, I'd heard, spoken, and described in so many very complicated ways that for me to just put it into very simple terms, I found myself carrying quite a lot of emotion. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, Elsa, and I didn't, I didn't hear the last part that you said about emotion. Uh, how did that fit with what you were saying? No, uh, I was saying the words. I, I, I found a kind of a catch of emotion in my throat. It's like, mm. whoa, okay, this is not coming out of my mouth. It's, it's, it makes it more real. Or I suddenly have to grapple with it in a new way. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I I try to take seriously your your um, qualifier of speaking to a really bright ten year old, and and I found that 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 challenging, and probably my speech was more towards a four or five year old, but um, and and that made me aware of how much I'm struggling with the ethics of how one speaks. I, I think because you put that 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 caveat in, I, I, I was very aware of that. It made it very difficult for me to try and express myself. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, that um, Michael, who I was in my group with, said that, you know, regarding this topic, we're all probably about 10 years old. And I, I really appreciated that. And in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks, I'm having a 60th birthday party, and my family is coming. And I imagine myself at this party actually walking around and telling everyone how much they matter to me. Because when, you know, when shit hits the fan, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to contact them will. And so, and I'm even bringing it. I'm telling you that you know we're in precarious times so anyway that that came up as well in this. 
Got it. Thank you. We have time for maybe one more person if you'd like to share about this particular exercise. I love it. It's Catherine with all the groups she told us, the four R's. Uh, within our small group at the end of the session, we I referred to Jem's paper, the original deep adaptation paper, and asked if June and Lee had had an opportunity to connect with that paper. I've sent them both the link to that in private chat. Um, but I read them the four questions associated with Jem's R's uh, with the qualifier that they, I found those questions very powerful for me in terms of what do I do next and where do I go? So for those of you who have seen them and read them and taken them to heart, I apologize, uh, but I will just quickly deem with your blessing, repeat them. So the first R is to resilience. What do we really want? Uh, is relinquishment what do we need to let go of so as to not make matters worse third uh, being restoration what could we bring back to help us with these difficult things that our ancestors perhaps knew more about than we do lately and the fourth R uh, which came in Jem's follow up paper reconciliation with what and whom shall we make peace as we are one new mortality? Catherine, thank you very much. I noticed on my end of what, you know, I was, I was trying to hear you speak and there was a lot of technical difficulty. There was a lot of breaking up in, in your signal. So uh, if there's any reassurance that I can offer, I'll be including um, the full paper of the Jim Bendel's four R's uh, in the in-between episodes emails that I'll be sending out just within a couple of days with the recordings of this call. And this call will need a lot of uh, tuning up and adjusting and editing to, because there have been quite a few glitches. Um, and I'll in, be sure to include all this, the uh, words to, you know, on the screen to support what you are sharing, Catherine. Thank you very much for bringing that. Um, we're, we're really officially at the end of time, and if someone needs to go, I absolutely understand. Um, I do have an announcement for uh, one of the sessions in June, the second session in June. I believe it's June 15th. This is quite a ways ahead, I realize, but I, I just want to set it up uh, so that as many people who are interested are set up to win to get there it's, you know arranging your calendar so that if you can be live on the call that uh, you can benefit from the call and of course it will be recorded also so you'll be able to to watch the recording and take advantage of it that way basically i'm i'm radically shifting gears here so thank you for your patience with this uh, one of the major focus areas of focus that I have for this work is uh, bringing people together into support groups or tribes or circling or whatever one might like to call it. I think it's one of the weakest suits, certainly in the USA, that um, that we have. We don't do close connection very well here. Um, I've been really on the lookout for. Uh, methodologies for uh, how to run support groups and um, how to have these groups be as empowering, as heartful, as human, as deeply rejuvenating as possible, in, given what we have to face. Uh, one of the people I've connected with about that is a man named Jay Earley. Uh, Dr. Earley is a therapist, and he's a facilitator, and he's, he's uh, written a number of books. The one that really struck me and brought me to him, him to my attention is one called Self-Therapy. The bottom line for me is I've been looking for how to bring powerful tools for self-healing to people like us in, in, the, in the coming times there's an extraordinary uh, volume of need 
for uh, supportive environments and the mental health community is just, it's already overwhelmed, not to mention that it will be flooded with people and need in, in just a f very short time. Jay Early has is, is just uh, posted a proposal, a paper, in which he's suggesting uh, the creation of a social movement, a movement that is really held and grounded in these kind of small groups. At the moment, he's calling it a study and action group. He might find a sexier name later, I don't know. I'll be sending out the, this proposal, this document that he's put out. I'll send you links to videos in which he describes this uh, possible movement. I, I will also send you a recent uh, episode of my podcast, which is the Poetry of Predicament podcast, which is a YouTube channel. So they're all videos. And I would invite you to subscribe so that you can just, you know, uh, hear these these interviews. Each of those pieces will give you a sense of what he's talking about and what he's offering. And uh, to jump right to the chase on June 15th, on that session, at this time of that session, at the end of that session, uh, Jay will join us and he will be offering to uh, escort those who are interested through a series of pi pilot meetings in order to basically train us, give us the, some of the skills that he brings to this type of group work. I, I will include far more information. It will be less hurried than this is now. But more than anything, I wanted those of you who are interested in this forming this kind of group with people in your own neighborhood, your own area, that this might be a useful tool kit to, to learn and take on from Jay. And by the way, his offering and whatever number of pilot sessions and so on that he leads out from that meeting uh, will be free of charge. So hopefully that is somehow of interest to uh, some number of you. Thank you so much for your uh, patience with the various technological glitches from today. Thank you for your heartfelt diving into what can be kind of dicey questions. And with your permission, I'll, I'll continue to bring questions of that caliber, and I'm wide open to your suggestions for uh, questions that you would like to see brought to our small group sessions, as well as other elements in this body of work, for instance, the four R's. I think that's it. You can feel free to unmute yourself and holler out and say goodbye <laughs> but i think that i've definitely overrun our time yeah. thank you goodbye bye bye folks bye, yeah, everyone. Glad thank you everybody bye. thank you elaine and william bye bye thank thanks you. everyone bye, -bye. bye. thank you yeah. bye sean and ribbon bye 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 all right everybody that we, we are immersed in a culture that uh, would have us never have these conversations. I think the default mode is to keep us very much full of the drama and the distraction of everyday life. And um, for those of us in the USA, um, they're doing a pretty good job of it. <laughs> it's, it's literally insane. So um, what I'd like to invite us to do uh, is to, again, shift gears volitionally. Just, uh, this, in, a, in an odd way, blends with the self-regulation uh, segment of what we'll be talking about as, in this series as the weeks go by self-regulation and being that that ability in ourselves to shift our state especially for when we're knocked off center when when we're not our 
best self. We've been knocked into some sort of reactive state. And, um, you know, I know for myself, I, I get grumpy, I get reactive. And uh, my skills at, at self-regulation are what bring me back to that center. Here, we may not be knocked off center. We may be just relaxed and present and so on. I would ask us to take it one step further. So that um, uh, often happens with the simplest of meditations. I uh, have sent you out a, um, a very basic heart and coherence meditation uh, from Carolyn Baker. It's, it's certainly not the only game in town. There's, you know, this is such a simple meditation is such a simple orientation to a grounded and centered space. Um, so I would just invite you to, uh, in these next few moments, like us all to just take a few deep breaths to bring a sense of expansion to uh, the area around our heart. And with each full breath, allow that, that uh, field around our heart to gently expand out into the space, into the further and further out into the room that you're in. So instead of talking about it, let's just do that for a few moments, a few long, easy breaths. And with each breath, allowing the field around your heart to expand. allowing that field around your heart to expand even beyond the walls of the building that you're in. And it, chances are you will have shifted to some degree or another even in this short time. So let's just pause there in terms of, of the formality. And I invite you to keep bringing yourself back to a similar state of diffused uh, boundaries of yourself and perhaps even connecting with other people in that same way. I've been finding it remarkably possible to connect in this way, in this expanded and more heartful way with people even in a video conference call. So um, I, would, I invite you to stay connected with your breath, with sensation, to be able to uh, ground yourself through just through the sensation of your hands on your own lap or on the desk in front of you. This can also be of great help in self-regulation and in an optimal presence. So. You know what, I would, I'm gonna do it. There's, there are only 17 of us on now, and I don't know if I've mentioned to you that there are um, close to 100 people in, that are signed up for this. And uh, it's, I'm humbled by the numbers, and I'm so appreciative, and I'm, I'm saddened that there aren't more of us live. And I promised myself that we would do the small groups to be able to have more of an in-depth connection with one another, and we're about to shift to that. But I, um, I would like to just do a, a very quick check-in to be able to uh, presence ourselves with our name, where we're from, and, um, and something that you are grateful for in your reality at the moment. So um, I'm just going to say names, and I would appreciate it if you would then um, unmute yourself and... Um, Say those things, name and where you are, where you are, and what you are grateful for. And um, the first person on my list is uh, someone on the phone, uh, 970 number. Uh, this is Mary. I'm on a 970 call from Durango. And I am grateful for 
the recent moisture that we got this past winter, taking us out of the drought. Oh, great. Mary, good to have you here. I used to live in Bayfield. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. And uh, thank you. And Anna, would you go next or Anna? Good morning. I'm Anna. Calling, I'm here from Calgary, Alberta. I'm grateful this morning for the flickering candlelight here beside me and for the first tiny little violets in the woods. Beautiful. Thank you. And uh, Christine, I have unmuted you. Hi. Uh, oddly enough, I'm also in Calgary, uh, Canada. So uh, I'm a family doctor, so I've been feeling really grateful for the opportunity to heal um, in these times. Great. Thank you so much. And Elaine, would you go next? Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Elaine Pierce. I live in the Russian River, Sonoma County. And um, at this moment, I'm grateful for the oil that's on my deck. All right. I know you have a lot of attention on the birds in your area, Elaine. Thank you. And um, it looks like next up would be Elzan. Would you check in? I. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I live in South Africa and I am grateful for, I'm getting a chance to do a bit of traveling soon. And uh, I have a, a gift of just going into some deep spaces with friends, which is, which is lovely. Great, thank you. Good to see you. And uh, Catherine, would you check in? Hello, I'm Catherine. I'm in Warwickshire, of England. And in this moment, I'm grateful for the sound of my daughter's laughter from the room behind me. She's away at university and rarely comes home. And it reminds me of her being little. Great, thank you. Uh, Kurt, would you go next? Yeah, I'm Kurt. I'm in Oakland, California. And uh, yeah, I had a wonderful drive with my daughter from Los Angeles to, to here. She lives in LA. And, and I got to play a podcast that I had just done with her. And that's kind of opening some of this conversation, which is very hard for her to have. So yeah, glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, Laura Keith Rolage, would you go next? Hi, I'm uh, normally I'm in Calgary as well, but this weekend I'm uh, in a small town in southern Alberta called Pincher Creek, and I'm visiting with my in-laws down here, and I'm grateful that I'm able to do that still, because they're lovely people. All right, thank you very much. And Laura, would you check in? Sorry, uh, Parker. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Laura Parker and I'm from Northern California. I live in Marin County in a small town called Rugby. And I am grateful for, I'm grateful for people who want to relate in this way, who are heart-centered and authentic relating. All right, thank you. Uh, Lee, would you check in? Hi, I'm grateful. My name is Lee, and I live in Chico, California, and that is the epicenter of the campfire that happened uh, six months ago. Um, I'm very grateful for the people that are taking in the animals that have been suffering and managed to escape. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Brownlee, would you check in? Hi, I'm Michael Brownlee. I'm in Boulder, Colorado. And I'm just very grateful for people who are waking up these days and willing to, to come forward and, and grapple these issues together. 
Great, thank you, Michael. Really great to have you here, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry to say that my list is mixing itself up as I'm going, so um, I'm, I'm hoping I'll remember everyone. Um, Jeffrey, would you check in? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Greetings from Durango. Uh, I'm married to Mary, who checked in moments ago. I'm grateful for the morning we just spent at our local farmer's market. Uh, it's where I connect with people who are in touch with the land, in touch with the vibrancy of life, you know, expressing itself. Um, and we're about to travel to the American Midwest, to Nebraska, which has been experiencing catastrophic flooding on an ongoing basis. So we're kind of going on a pilgrimage to the epicenter. And you know, this is one of the places where collapse is most imminent, apparently, because the American food supply is in peril due to uh, these extraordinary rainfall events that are ongoing. So uh, we're in the midst of it, and it's a bit of a frantic thing, but I'm glad to be touching base with all of you right now. Thanks. Thank you. And Richard, would you check in? Hi, Richard Edelman from uh, Bodega, California. And I'm grateful for uh, a number of things. Um, uh, experiencing the afterglow from uh, a walk on the beach that we took with our dog yesterday. And also from uh, some nice communications from a couple of members of the group uh, online over the last couple of days. Great. Thank you so much. And Ruben, would you go next? Happy to. Oh, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I'm Ruben Nelson. Uh, I live west of Calgary in the Rocky Mountains. Um, I'm grateful for the young techies who spent their extra hours developing the kind of technology that lets us connect this way. Mm, thank you, me too. <laughs> Me too. Uh, Sean, would you go next? Hey, everybody. Um, I am, I'm Sean. I'm from uh, North Carolina. And today I'm just thankful for a friendship in my life. Um, had a chance to spend some time with some people I hadn't seen for a few years this morning. And it was good to see them again. Thanks very much, Sean. And Susan, would you check in? I'm Susan, and I'm calling from Costa Rica. I am grateful to be here. I'm grateful to have the means to be here. And I'm especially grateful that I'm connecting with like-minded people through this group and uh, another group, because it would be a very lonely, scarier place without this connection. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, William, have we heard from you yet? All right. Uh, William from Williamsburg, Virginia. Keep things simple. And I am grateful for the collection of wisdom here in this group. Uh, I'm a lifelong dot connector. I thought I was doing well until I realized the complexity this group represented. And so I'm overwhelmed again, but uh, I'm. I'm reveling in it, so thank you. Great, thank you. Good to have you here. Is there anyone who I have forgotten or stepped over here? Thank you. Uh, just that brief check-in makes a huge difference for me, and I, I appreciate if that, uh, I hope it was valuable for you as well. I come from such a long history of in-person, in the room, face-to-face -face training, and and uh, learning and seminaring that um, you know without having some amount of interaction, um, some amount of presence from each person, it makes it quite difficult. So thank you for that. 